it's super interesting listening to what y'all have been up to. I think the InterSource Foundation is, um, you got, y'all have a lot to be proud of. And uh, I find it a privilege to have this opportunity to talk to y'all now. So let me share my screen. Just a sec. And looks like screen sharing is paused. So can y'all see? Can y'all see now? Yeah. There you go. Excellent. Cool beans. All right. So I am going to have uh, I'm going to give you my perspective on what the principles of open source are and try to tie those together with inner source, but I'm not an expert on inner source. So what I will be talking about with respect to inner source is more um, some of the experiences I've had within uh, within the companies that I've worked for. Um, so, but first, whoops, we, uh, so, yeah, um, my, as I said, my name is Merle Kranz. Um, I have served as a board member of the Apache Software Foundation. Um, I've also done a lot of other things for the, for the ASF um, to, to try and support that mission. Um, and I'm also very interested in um, the economics of open source. I, I did my master's thesis in that. And part of what, what I'm going to present now is um, things that I learned while doing my master's thesis. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about things that I have learned um, working in software, both in open source and in closed source. Um, but we should. Ah, I did have a slide in here with a group photo. Y'all uh, had such a beautiful group photo earlier. So could we do that again? Will? So everybody say cheese. Thank you. Y'all are awesome. So the first bit. Um, so the, the approach that I'm going to take to this, I'm going to have a chat with y'all about um, about this the open source from the point of view of the why, how, what model. Um, this is a model that was developed by Simon Sinek, um, where he pointed out that a lot of times when we talk about software, when we talk about products, we're talking about what? We're talking about the product that, um, the, that the user receives or the consumer receives in their hands, but we're not talking about why we're not talking about um, what they're using it for or um, what their understanding is of your business and why your business exists. So um, I'm going to approach this kind of backwards. I'm going to start with the what. Um, I'm going to talk about open source, starting with the what, and then I'm going to move back to the how, and then I'm going to move back to the why. And then I'm going to step out again from there and talk about some of my experiences with inner source. So just a spoiler, uh, because I can't help but give away the, the punchline, open source is about collaboration. And this is something that, that it has in common with inner source. Inner source is also about collaboration. So first off, what is open source? Well, the um, open source initiative has defined, has defined what open source is, there's a there's a um, 10 point definition that basically boils down to open source is source code that you can access, that you can change, that you can examine, and that you can use to build things that you need. But saying that is open is, is really just saying what it is. It's not saying why we participate in it. Still though, let's dig into that a bit. Like what does that mean that it's open? Because that actually has some, um, some consequences, the fact that it's open. Uh, so when open source is, is published, uh, you can copy it, and by copying it, you don't take it away, right? So one person can copy it, and then another person can copy it too, and no matter how many copies are made from it, you can continue making copies of it. Uh, for, in economics, this is known as non-rivalrous. Uh, it's also not possible because of the licensing for open source it's not possible to prevent others from benefiting from it so you can't go and say um, linux is now uh, no longer available for the rest of the world because it's open source legally uh, you can only everybody can use it as they as they please this is the definition in economics of a public good and because it's a public good 
it, that actually has another consequence. Um, public goods are things in, in this context, working together on a public good is a strong link game. Now, this is an economic concept. You're probably not familiar with it. This is a, a result of research that Baldwin and Clark published in 2006, in case you want to look it up. But let me explain what that means using an example that you're familiar with. You probably have already heard of the prisoner's dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma is a situation in which two prisoners, um, two, two criminals are caught and put in prison and put in solitary confinement. And now they're being interviewed and the, um, the, the police are trying to get them to, to rat each other out. If they don't rat each other out, then they will go to prison for a year each. And if they do, if one of them betrays the other, but the other one stays uh, loyal, then um, the one who does who, who betrays will get no time in prison, but the one who stays loyal will get 10 years in prison. If both of them betray the other, then they will each get five years in prison. And so each of them examining their own good, their local good, will choose to betray each other because that gives them individually the best result. But in total, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a good result for them. For, for either of them. The better result would have been if they didn't betray each other. This is called a weak link game, a weak link game rather, because the, the, the least collaborative or the, the most selfish approach um, gets selected just because of the pressures, the economic pressures involved. But open source isn't a weak link game. Open source is a strong link game. It's a game in which the most generous contribution determines the outcome for everybody involved. Um, so if we imagine a world, and this is something of a simplification, but if we imagine a world in which there are two developers and um, they, when they produce their work, um, they share it, they can't prevent the other one from seeing it. The situation, if neither of them chooses to work, um, then they will, uh, if, if neither of them chooses to work, then they will both have a benefit of zero, like nothing happens. Um, if one of them chooses to work, then both of them benefit. So that means that the value um, that both of them achieve um, is the same, except that the person who chooses to work spent their work. So they lost the cost of their work. But as long as the value of the work that they perform, allow, the value that the software that they create is greater than the cost of the work, then they have an incentive to produce that work. And that's true for both of them. And so if they don't communicate with each other in advance, the outcome will be that both of them choose to work, that both of them then produce this open source project and they can choose between the two, um, they can choose between the, the two outputs um, and decide which one is better for each of them. And it could be they keep what they did, they could be they swap, they could be they share one and they continue working on it from there. Um, and this, like, if we, we move away from the simplification into the real world where there's actual um, communication, then this can be optimized. So what that means in the broader sense is that um, not, all, uh, not all economic games, not all economic situations mean that, that somebody wins and somebody loses. Some of them are situations in which everybody wins and which, in which the economic incentives also push people to collaborate. And that's one of the great things about open source is that it is such a situation. And I want to also emphasize here that an open source contribution, now I've been talking in the last bit about coding, but an open source contribution isn't just coding. There's a lot of other things that you can do to contribute to open source as well. You can organize events, you can triage issues, you can um, write documentation, you can test, you can do manual tests, you can do um, automated testing. Uh, you can help new people get started in a project. You can moderate a project's lists. All of these things are an open source contribution. So that's the what. That is, a, in, in a broad sense, what open source is. Now I'm going to talk about how we do open source, and I'm taking a very Apache-centered view on this. Um, and I'm going to talk about the Apache way. Now remember the Apache Software Foundation has over 800 members and each of them has their own perspective on this. So this is my perspective on this, but I am uh, also drawing this from what I've learned from others. So there is some, there is consensus on these points. So one important point, um, the Apache Software Foundation is charitable. 
we at Apache create code for users and we do it without uh, an expectation um, beyond our employment contracts of, of being um, recompensed for that. We're giving something away. Uh, I think that, that the generosity behind that um, ends up paying itself back precisely because of the, the, um, the explanation I just gave uh, about the economic incentives. But I think in, for, for many members of the Apache Software Foundation, for many contributors to Apache projects, they do it because it feels good to help other people. And the Apache way is also consensus based. So when we uh, make decisions about the direction of a project, we don't have a, a boss or a leader who sits down and says, okay, listens to all the arguments and then says, we'll go this direction. Uh, no, instead we sit down and, uh, and decide together which direction we're going to go. That means that sometimes decisions are slow. Uh, but it means that as a result, you get better decisions. Uh, this is especially useful for code that is shared uh, because you get longer lasting architectures and uh, things that can be used in, in, in a larger variety of ways. Which brings us to the next point, the Apache way is meritocratic. We make the decisions based on the merit of the options available. Uh, we don't make the decisions based on a position of somebody. We don't make the decisions based on what company they work for. We don't make the decisions based on um, how much money somebody's willing to pay to get something done. We make the decisions based on to what extent that this option or that option will benefit the users. And this is true of code decisions, and this is true of community membership de decisions. Um, Apache is meritocratic in in the the least uh, uh, sarcastic ways. I know meritocracy is also used um, sometimes as a criticism. Um, I'm referring to actual um, merit uh, within the context of benefiting our users. The Apache way is also transparent, and what that means is, and this is this is key to the consensus based decision making, this is also key to making decisions based on the merit of the options available, that uh, all decision making processes happen in a place where all um, participants in that project can see the process happening. At Apache, that means they happen on the mailing list. Um, and it also means that uh, delays are built in for, for larger, more consequential decisions to make sure that people have an opportunity to participate, even if they are um, not online every day of the week. So you don't like send out a question on Friday and then make the decision Saturday morning. Um, you give people a couple of days to participate. And it also means that the, the foundation of every decision is publicly available in some way or another. So you can always refer back to it. You have a, a paper trail as well. Um, this is a way to improve uh, the perception of fairness in a project, not just the perception, real fairness of, in, in a project. It's also a way to make sure that as many people as possible can take part and that you get a broader basis for your group intelligence and in making group decisions. And finally, the Apache way is pragmatic. We move forward step by step, and the next step is not always perfection. The next step is just better. Um, and this applies to all of the things that I said above before, and of course, to the code. We are looking for solutions to problems and not uh, castles in the, in the cloud. Um, we're looking for, uh, for the next iteration um, at every point so that we can uh, create, create things, create things that people need. So all of that, I think, points to, in some extent to why we do open source. Um, I think like one of the possibilities we could say why we do better, why we do open source is because we get better results. Uh, if you work this way, then you can leverage a, a broader range of perspectives and come up with better ideas. And you can bring your own ideas into it. So you have an opportunity to um, influence the architecture uh, in a fair way. These are possible reasons for why we might do open source. I think more important than those two, at least for me, um, is that open source also gives us opportunities to learn. I really appreciate the opportunities to, to um, 
collect perspectives and, and grow from the things that uh, people who are very different from me and have very different life experiences from me halfway across the world have to offer. And this kind of brings us to what I think is the biggest point about open source. Um, I like to do open source because of the sense of community, because of the connections that I find there. So why do we do open source? Well, because making things together with other people, with other human beings, brings us joy. And this is where I feel that open source and inner source have important things in common. I think this is really the reason why we come together. It may be obscured by many of the other circumstances, but these are the reasons why we come together in corporations to make software as well, is because we like making things together. Um, we may do it because we, we may also do it because it pays, but I don't think we would be doing it if we didn't enjoy it. And that then infer, informs how we do inner source as well. So I'm going to talk here about some stories, and I know Denise is the queen of storytelling. Um, so this is somewhat from, from inspiration from some of the things that I've learned from Denise. Um, I'm going to talk about some stories that uh, that I've experienced in some of the places that I've worked. Um, I currently work for a company that does a lot of open source, um, but even in companies that don't do open source, I think some of the, the insights that uh, that they apply here. So um, this this is an experience at a company that uh, that doesn't actually do open source. I was working on a project where everybody eight, eight teams together with roughly eight to 10 people on each of these teams were collaborating on an API that all of these teams needed. And what we did was we set up a, a weekly meeting, it was very short, in which each of these eight teams, and it varied from time to time, but each of these eight teams would send a representative to the meeting to talk about the things that they were working on, adding to the API, adjusting in the API, um, but also the things that they needed from the API. And what this meant was that teams that were working on things that may from the user value look different, um, but from the, the requirements that that set to the API looked the same, they were able to discover this. So um, lesson here is don't be shy and, you know, create forums in which people feel welcome to communicate or over communicate about their needs and about what they have to offer. And then in those forums, ask for what you need and listen to what others need and find ways to put these two pieces together. So next story um, is a little more recent. Uh, an employee of mine worked on a hackathon project and at Grafana we do hackathons on a regular basis. Um, he worked on a hackathon project uh, and the advantage of working on this hackathon project was that he discovered uh, that there was already a project going on um, to fulfill this customer need. Um, so what we did uh, as a result was um, we had a chat and uh, I asked how interested he was in continuing working on this. He was very interested in continuing working on this. So he decided to throw away his hackathon code and donate one day a week to working on this, this project with his other team. Now, what that meant was he had the opportunity to learn another programming language um, from some of the foremost practitioners um, in that programming language. And he also had the opportunity to provide his own expertise, which was in the, in the front end area, to provide his own expertise, which was lacking in that team, um, and bring the, 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 the things that he learned into his other four days of the week um, to, to enhance his work in those areas as well. So lesson here was try something new. Worst that can happen is you fail and one way or the other you're going to learn. And the final example was from earlier this year. Uh, three members of my team participated in a different hackathon. Um, and they were kind of at the at the beginning before they had started, they were kind of lacking for inspiration and they were they, they were feeling kind of down. And then one of them saw a, uh, a I think it was a Reddit post about um, somebody who had gotten Doom to run on a pregnancy test. And uh, so he sat down with the other guys and he was like, I bet you we can get Doom running on Grafana. And the thing is, like for them, they didn't see a commercial use for this. They were doing it because it was fun. Um, and as their manager, I said, hey, it's a hackathon. I think there should also be room for having fun. 
But in the process, they discovered multiple minor errors um, and ways to speed up uh, the, the code that they, were, that they were using in order to render Doom. Um, and they also just inspired everybody who saw this. It was just a lot of fun. And it helped to build um, good relationships between people inside the, the company and also to build good relationships between the company and our open source community as well. I think in everything we do, it's very, very important that we make space for, for just having fun. And I hope that um, our conference uh, these next two days will also give us the opportunity to have fun and enjoy each other. Which brings us to the question, what is Intersource? And the truth is, I'm not qualified to answer the question, what is Intersource? I think that we'll have many pieces of the answer to that question over the next couple of days, and I'm really uh, excited to hear what y'all have to say. Um, here's the, the definition of Intersource Commons from, from y'all's website. Um, it is dedicated to creating and sharing knowledge about Intersource, the use of open source best practices for software development within the confines of an organization. And if that doesn't shout community, I don't know what does. So I'm going to hand it back to y'all. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. It was a real pleasure.